It is critical for quality and validation professionals to stay on the pulse of emerging policies and regulations from the FDA's computer software assurance draft to the newly released EU medical device general safety and performance guidance, evolving regulations are a constant. Our network of professionals cover these topics and more in print, in person and online, bringing the latest industry news and tools to our audience of hardworking experts just like you. The IVT network gives you the tools you need to succeed in your profession, providing innovative content, industry research, lifelong learning and opportunities for networking on a global level. For our listeners, receive 15 months for the price of 12 plus an exclusive discount with your new subscription. Subscribe today with IVT Network, the best decision you'll make all year for your life sciences career. This is Voices in Validation, brought to you by IVT Network. IVT Network is your expert source for life science regulatory knowledge. Voices in Validation brings you the best in validation and compliance topics. We interview industry experts from pharma, biotech, med devices, and laboratories. Here is the host of Voices in Validation, Stacy. source for industry news, networking, and education. As part of our continued effort to give back to the industry and our valued audience, we are sharing this insightful session from our recent conference. We invite you to listen in this week to the Excellence and Next Generation Approaches to Quality Systems Monitoring panel discussion, highlighting the current data governance landscape with comments on analytics, metrics, and data capabilities in a changing technological environment. Making up this session are the moderator, Michelle Miller, and esteemed panelists, Elise Deegan, Nula Kalnan, and Daniel Kaparos. So without further ado, here we go. Hello everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our panel discussion, Excellence and Next Generation Approaches to Quality System Monitoring and Analysis, Perspectives and Innovation. My name is Michelle Miller. I will be the moderator for this session. I'm the Director of Global Validation at Illumina. In this role, I lead global non-product validation across the company. This includes the strategy and execution of validation for facilities, manufacturing processes, consumables and instrument production, quality systems, enterprise software, and other systems across the global sites at Illumina. I'm really looking forward to this conversation today. So to get us started, let's meet each of the panelists. Elise, can you please kick us off? Hi, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Elise Deegan, and I've been in life sciences for over 20 years. And recently, I held the role of IT lead at a cell therapy plant and IT CSV director. So I've gone between the quality assurance roles and the IT roles. Looking forward to discussing these hot topics with this panel. Daniel? Yes, thank you, Michelle. Hello and good morning to everyone. My name is Daniel Caparos and I'm the Global Head of Data and Digital Quality at Merck Healthcare, KGA in Darmstadt, Germany. I was born in Barcelona and after finishing my diploma in chemical engineering, I decided to move to Germany seeking for new opportunities. During the last 23 years, I've been involved in almost all different steps of a computer assistance life cycle in the pharmaceutical industry, from software developer, up to the head of IT of two different global pharmaceutical companies in Europe. As part of these roles, I've been involved in validation activities and since more than 18 years. Currently, I don't have an IT role anymore, but since 2016, I'm working in the quality assurance department of the healthcare R&D business of Merck GAE in Darmstadt. And here I'm responsible to set up the global framework for computer assistance validation and mainly driver of the digitalization of these processes and their related activities. Now with my team who is responsible for all data and digital quality topics, including validation, data integrity, data analytics and reporting, um, quality risk management, and obviously also responsible for the electronic quality management system, which supports all our QMS processes. Thank you. Thank you. Nula? Yes, good, uh, good morning to you. And I'm coming to you on this international panel live from Dublin in Ireland, where it's afternoon for us. 
Um, but uh, like Alice, I have over 20 years in the industry and started out actually as a uh, process automation engineer, a um, little bit like Daniel writing code um, and having been involved in um, many, many startups and um, operational facilities. Um, uh, I uh, eventually uh, went went back to school and um, uh, did a PhD in regulatory science. And now the work that I do is really working with companies to come up with practical patient focused um, uh, excellence strategies and whether that's cultural excellence, whether it's quality excellence, whether it's operational excellence, um, uh, the, the work spans all of that, um, including risk excellence. So. Um, as a consultant, I, I lead a company called uh, Biofarm Excel, but I'm also the founder of the Quality Risk Management Institute. Um, and in my academic career, I continue to do research and teaching uh, with uh, at TU Dublin, uh, where we have a pharmaceutical regulatory science team really coming up with practical uh, solutions for the industry. So uh, a leg in lots of camps, uh, but looking forward to today's discussion. Yes, wonderful. So we have a lot of expertise on this panel. I'm really excited to jump right in. So let's get started. So what types of data are being monitored and analyzed as part of the quality management system and in general, any quality risk? I'm you know, wondering, is this only typical quality data like audits, observations, or are we taking other types of data often used by the business functions? Daniel, let's start with you. Well, um, traditionally we are monitoring typical quality data resulting from our quality processes like deviations, audits, as you mentioned, observations, capas and changes, yeah. In the past, some of our processes were already digitized or at least partially, will, while others were still based on paper forms and having wet signatures. Um, with this kind of data, keeping the oversight and monitoring our QMS was a tough exercise with lots of Excel trackers, manual reports, and so on. But by beginning of 2020, we successfully implemented a new eQMS system, which provide us with the possibility to fully digitize all our processes and maintain all data records, as well as the related process workflows in fully native electronic way. Um, now we have the possibility to really track the status of our processes and we are moving one step forward. So we also implemented with this new EQMS uh, quality risk management. And this provides us the possibility of making a new paradigm change, moving from reactive to a proactive quality organization. And our focus right now is trying to also get access to additional business data that can provide us some kind of um, indicators of potential risk and try to avoid issues be before they happen. Great, thank you. Anyone else like to chime in on that? Yeah, I think the thing, it, we're monitoring data. I, you know, what I'm looking for sometimes is, are we setting thresholds on data so we get alerts? Because sometimes it feels like in our industry, we're looking at data after it happened, but if it continues to happen, you know, we're not really, I'm noticing a real struggle where I've been at to set a threshold so you get an alert if you keep seeing this type of deviation or this type of kappa. So I think there's a lot of exciting technology coming out so we can get those alerts. So, you know, so we're it's real time. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of data to be looked at there. Yeah. And, and just picking up on that, Michelle, it's interesting. I mean, what we've been talking about here is that we do a lot of um, a trending of lagging data. Um, and um, those thresholds that Alice is talking about, you know, they're, they're really important in terms of understanding our lagging data. And even the way in which we slice and dice that lagging data, very often we end up looking at, you know, single points of data. You know, you're, you're looking at this month or last month or last quarter um, instead of actually looking at it as a trend. So when we look at uh, lagging data as a single point of, 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 of a source of, of information, um, it tells us very little. You know, is it more than last month, less than last month? Does it matter? Um, you know, it tells us very little. But when, at least when we're uh, trending that lagging data, 
out of trend protects the business out of spec protects the patient. Um, and if we could take that, you know, in terms of how we look at that data, in terms of that looking for those trends and getting those threshold alerts, that's one way that we can become a little bit more proactive, um, even if we are still looking in the rear view mirror. But I'm hoping that some of these newer sources of data allow us to get much more predictive and preventive um, in terms of, of how we're looking and looking at leading indicators. And that's probably where a lot of the work um, uh, that we do and where we see around maturity um, of quality systems, where you're really looking at behavioral indicators. And that tends to be much more tactical. And you, know, you need to be able to look at that data as well. That may not be in an electronic format because you may not be capturing it at that level, but where it needs to be um, viewed um, is where the people who have the most impact on, on the outcomes that matter um, uh, to the patient and to the product. So tracking that leading indicator and having that available at local tiers, you know, at their shift huddles on their visual management boards so that they can predictively and proactively change um, a behavior before it hits the stats, before we have another kappa or we have another day, uh, deviation. Um, so it's a little bit of of uh, we, you know all this digitalization is great but there's humans in here as well so we also have to take on board that that that's also um uh, you know an area that we need to connect the dots between what might be electronic forms of data and know-how and tacit forms of of, of behavioral type indicators Absolutely. So, Nola, if you wouldn't mind continuing, you know, what do we mean by excellence in terms of quality system monitoring and analysis? So you were mentioning kind of that balance, the business and the patient. So is this about being in compliance inspection ready or reviewing this as a business capability? Yeah. And, you know, my goodness, I, I mean, I've been working um, with uh, through the ISPE committees on um, uh, the quality metrics initiative and, and doing research um, with my colleagues in St. Gallen um, from the benchmarking team there for FDA on the quality metrics. And of course, you know, we, we look at this whole issue around what is being measured. And um, when I go and work with organizations then, and I look at their, let's call them their quality dashboards or their, you know, their scorecards, um, apart from the fact that they're largely historical documents because they're looking at lagging um, indicators, um, there's also a, a lot of the action that's being driven out of that and a lot of the decision making that's being driven out of those insights uh, tends to be around being inspection ready. Are we, are we good for our next audit? Um, are we in compliance? And of course, we're not going to be in business if we're not in compliance, but that's a minimum threshold. That's a minimum requirement. What we should be looking at when we're looking at excellence in terms of our businesses is really thinking more in terms of whether it's risk management, whether it's quality excellence, what's good for the patient is good for the business. And bringing that overall cost of quality down because we're being not only more effective, which is what the regulators want us to be, but also more efficient in the way that we're doing that for the business because ultimately, there's a whole body of stakeholders there in terms of our shareholders and the the, the people who work within the organization, you know, who have um, uh, have a vested interest in the in the in the business doing well. So for me, quality risk management is a business capability, or or risk management in itself is a, a business capability. You know, having appropriate level of oversight on your quality systems monitoring. And having, you know, having that available visibility of that so that the decisions are action biased and that it's not just, you know, are we better at being bad than we were at being bad last month? You know, surely there, you know, that, that, that there has to be another paradigm and that can be the, you know, we can kind of be on the on, on, the, on the route to the bottom uh, if, if we're only looking at, you know, at this from a, are we in compliance? Are we ready for our next inspection? As opposed to, are we really enabling our business to do its best work? And are we enabling our, our, our associates in our businesses to do their best work every day? Thank you. Any other thoughts from the panelists on that? Yeah, I, I think that was great. I also noticed that the use of dashboards, I've seen a lot of focus on only having green dashboards. So I've been in companies where like everything can look green because the dashboard's being presented. And, you know, it's a behavior thing again that we have to get used to seeing some red. And if you're not seeing some red, 
I'm very suspect on it. So I think those dashboards are fantastic as long as we can use them, you know, and not always think it has to all be green. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if we were just focusing on compliance and to be inspection ready, we would be probably missing our goal. I think the future of a modern quality organization is really to provide an added value to the organization itself, yeah, to promote quality culture, yeah, to really help the business, to really help the patients in order to be more, to improve the overall processes, yeah, and to improve the uh, patient safety and, and the product quality at the end of the day. Yeah? And I think if we, as, as a smaller also, also mentioned, yeah, if we would only focus on to be compliant and to be inspection ready, I think this is not the way uh, how a modern quality organization should, should act. Right. Yeah, and just uh, just coming back on that, Michelle, there's w one thing. Um, uh, uh, I co-host a, a podcast for the JVT Network called Risk Revolution with one of my um, dear colleagues, Laurie Richter. Um, and we had a whole um, a section of one of our podcasts about fearing the red. You know, um, and if we're building learning organizations, um, it, as to Alice's point, if everything is green um, uh, on the dashboard, apart from the fact that, you know, there's clearly something wrong, you're not setting your targets high enough. Learning, there isn't an opportunity. You're not identifying gaps and you're not looking at skills and capabilities and competencies that can, you know, that can build that forward. And, and just as a, a humorous point, um, I, I refer to when there's too much green there, I refer to uh, those metrics as watermelon metrics. They're polished up and lovely and green on the outside. But as soon as you dig in a little bit, there's plenty of red under the skin. Oh, I like that. A watermelon metric. I might take that one with me. <laughs> Uh, so Elise, I wonder if I could direct this next question to you. With data spanning a multitude of sources and systems and multiple formats, how is our industry addressing the challenge of harnessing all the data pools within a company? Yeah, this, this is, I think we've struggled with this for years. You're going to hear, you know, there's some great new platforms. You're going to hear things like data lakes, data marts, data warehouses, data platforms. I mean, you can name, we could play Jeopardy on all these terms. But I think it's really the technology is there, but there's still trouble. Like if you're having a data warehouse or a data, you know, data lake, it's like getting the data all in one place. But then how do we parse it out and start using it to the right people in these data marts? And then when you start to talk about where the data come from, did it come from a validated system? Is it GXP? When we're querying the data, are we qualifying our querying, whether we're using Power BI? tools, things like this. So I think it's, first of all, I mean, I think the technology is there in what, you know, like a snowflake platform, things like that. But again, it's that business process behind the scenes. So do we harness all of our data, get it in a data lake, start to take it out in these GXP data marts that we can really start to do analysis on it, pull reports on it. But I've seen it over and over again, people are hesitant and there's a there's a big lack of trust where did the data come from do we have separate lakes and just pull in from regulated systems and then do it that way and then no one's full-time job is really to manage the data we've thrown around roles like you're the data owner you're the data steward you're the data whatever but it's like their second job i really think the industry i'm seeing more and more of data scientists and data things in each functional group and i think we have to get there because everyone cannot do all their other operational jobs and then be controlling all this data and i i really think we we aren't using our data it as we should be in this industry because Number one, some of us don't trust where it came from. We want to pull it ourselves. But the technology, again, is there. I just think our business processes and ownership is not there yet. And hopefully we'll get there. I mean, data warehouses, great for structured data, right? But we have so much unstructured data out there coming from everywhere. That's why we do have to go down that data lake technology so we can just get it all in there wherever it's coming from. But lots of opportunities. I'm excited because the technology's caught up quite a bit. It's just we have to catch up now. Wondering too, maybe we pivot the conversation slightly. Once we find that right data for the right situation at the right time, 
you know, at least something you're talking about, how do we have confidence in that data? So maybe kind of expanding on, you know, whether there's oversight or tagging to ensure it's true data and ready for use. And then how do we standardize these practices and processes across the business so that then we get some standardization? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think here's an area I think we're we're really making some good progress with the data integrity initiatives where in the past we were not doing taking our time to do data process maps quite as well as we're doing it now. We're really going in and saying, OK, we're even naming our data. What is master data and what is operational data? Right. What is the master data data about data, our workflows, our value lookups? And then how does that data, what's that life cycle of that data in that system, you know, from the creation, whether we archive it, destroy it. So we're really doing a good job, I feel, lately because of the data integrity initiatives and all the audit trail things. But again, I think it's the whole going out, what's the system, what were the operational controls around that data to protect the data in the system, the technical controls around it, the access controls, and what system did it come through? What, how can we tag it? Did it come from a validated GXP system? Did it come from a business operation system? How did it get into the warehouse or data mart? Do we take it directly out of the system? But again, you know, we're we're still seeing a lot of lack of understanding what phase that data is in. If it's approved, how long ago was it approved? Is it still true, right? Is there three of these approved? Because we've all done queries where we've shown up with the same data and we're like, well, which one do we pick? So that's where I think we really need to get a life cycle on this data. We're, we're, do, we're good at doing it for documents and things like this, right? We've been doing that for years. But when it's just pure raw data coming from our lab systems and stuff, we're really not doing a good life cycle job on that, right? We're not saying, where was this raw data used? Sometimes we'll pull it through the submission and the tables and things, but right at the beginning, we're not saying, where will this data be used? What life cycle is it in? What system did it come from? Things like that. Again, it's got to have that data ownership, but someone has to control it in that functional group too, because it's they just shouldn't be looking at their data during the validation or doing like that, you know, the audit trail review, things like that. So it's, it's we've come a long way with our data process mapping, our life cycles on data, but I think there's a lot of work again to be done. But way back when we weren't really even mapping our data processes as, as well as we're doing today. Right, come a long way. And then what I'm hearing you say is with some additional proactive work, right? Instead of thinking about it after the fact, because as we've been talking about, there's just so much data coming from so many different sources. Yeah, in the migration, you know, we're all part of, I think the last company I was at, we bought, we got bought twice, right? We merged twice. So then you have the challenge of now going into one company's data, going into another company's data and another system. And that can get really um, wild without any tagging. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And just to um, just to pick up on that, I mean, we, we need to remember that there's a there's a, a data hierarchy that starts with data at the bottom. You know, it's the DIKW data, information, knowledge and wisdom. Now, wisdom is a little bit Yoda for me. That's a little bit Zen. Um, uh, but, you know, I like to think of that as th th that part, that wisdom part is the insights that drive the decisions that we're, you know, capable of making. And of course, it's really important that, you know, this data you know, the quality of the data and the curation and uh, life cycle management of that data is is um, is managed in a, in a business process to to Alice's point. And, and yet data stewardship, you know, in terms of data scientists and, and, and people who have responsibility for that is really important. But ultimately, we have to remember that why are we have, you know, data is not just there for data's sake, data is there to drive the insights that enable us to make, um, uh, you know, uh, knowledge-based decisions, uh, and 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 you know, b based on hard facts and science, and and that's the piece. You know, I do a lot of work in knowledge management, and I work with with another team in ISP on on knowledge management. We're we're just about to bring out a best practice guide through the ISP um, uh, guide team, um, and you know, we've been doing a lot of work around what's happening in industry and who's doing what around knowledge management, which of course is tagged 
as one of the key enablers to a an effective PQS pharmaceutical quality system. You know the two the dual enablers are risk risk management and knowledge management, and and uh, while we went ahead and 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 brought out a whole ICHQ nine on risk management, we have about four sentences or five I think tops in ICHQ ten on knowledge management. So, you know everybody's been kind of doing their own um, uh, version of what does that mean for them, and I think you know as an industry we don't use what we know or manage what we know as a as an asset. And there's a lot to be done there around right data, right situation, right time, but also who is curating that knowledge. So having an overarching architecture that understands that we're trying to make business decisions, and that might help us prioritize which pool of data do we want to go and, and, and fish in? Um, because, you know, what are the priorities in terms of products or patients or, you know, um, markets that we need that we need to actually access that um, deep vein of, of data that we might have this 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 lake we're all floating on now, you know? Um, but I think we have to remember that it has to come within that knowledge architecture um, uh, so that we're driving decisions as a result of, of, of this data. And we're not just, we're not just, you know, generating it for, and, and the cost of, cur you know, curating it um, for, for the sake of us, you know? Yes, absolutely. So then along those lines, um, what role does leadership play in establishing a proactive action oriented quality oversight process? So, you know, when we think about the enhanced data and analytics and dashboards that are delivered, are we using them uh, to increase our ability to take more timely actions? And, you know, what's the leadership role in this on the behavior side? Nuala, you started talking about that earlier. I wonder if we could come back to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that this is um, something that we have not done well. You know, when we talk about the effectiveness of our pharmaceutical quality systems, um, you know, the effectiveness of our, our PQS, very often what we're talking about is, you know, producing those metrics that we talked about earlier on and how many of these do we have? How many of those do we have? How many of those events are we reviewing? Um, as opposed to actually really looking at the um, uh, the effectiveness of our of our decision making. So even though we have all these um, uh, business processes in, in place, um, uh, you know, like, you know, when we come to looking at the quality system monitoring, you may have a quality council or a quality review board that's meeting, you know, on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis. But are we really looking at the effectivity of the decision making that they're doing? Or is it just an update? Is it a briefing pack, you know, where they have to sit through 50 slides in a deck with all the, the dashboards and the charts? But what are they doing as a result of that? Is it driving either differences in the way in which we're running the business or is it driving um, enhancements and improvements in the way in which we're managing our, our quality management systems? Um, and sometimes I've, I feel there's a disconnect there. You know, we're checking the boxes, we're doing all the all the pieces, but again, we get back to that. Are we doing it because of compliance? Or are we really trying to build in effectiveness? And, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, Daniel mentioned uh, risk management earlier on, you know, and being proactive. Do we even measure the amount of preventive actions we're taking as opposed to corrective actions? Do we have that as one of our key metrics? I know we're all obsessed with how many kappas did we close in the last 30 days. I'd be much more interested in how many kappas did we start in the first three days after we knew we had to do a kappa rather than, you know, because that's a that's an effectivity metric um, and it's a little bit more predictive. Uh, I find the um, how many kappas we closed in 30 days. I get the bar um, ruling and how we ended up with the 30 days, but I, I find that is is not an effectiveness metric of your quality system. It's a... <clears throat> You know, it's a uh, it's a um, an activity based metric of how busy your quality folk were on the last Friday of the month, um, uh, signing off their deviations and their and their kappas. So, are we really looking at this? You know, for instance, can can we measure how much prevention as opposed to cure correction are we doing? And do we even try and track that? Are we saying it's eighty twenty? We'd like it to be seventy thirty, sixty forty. Uh, the other thing then when we look at, um, you know, really having these action based decisions, um, are we are we looking at the opportunity of um, how much um, 
uh, how much not just prevention but also proactive actions as opposed to reactive actions so how often are we going out to do continuous improvement activities that are reducing risk and are we measuring the amount of risk reduction we're getting from our continuous improvement and opex activities i know we measure return on investment of you know how many man hours uptime have we got you know because we're doing more maintenance or how much yield more yield have we got but are we also measuring how much have we reduced the likelihood of risk to occur on that system as a result so there's there's much more you know of measuring are we being effective than just um you know are we are we meeting our lagging requirements yeah yeah i can agree more and i would love to see a metric when I was in quality, were you able to make this quality decision based on data, right? Did you have the data in your role to pull to make this decision? Just a quick metric. I would love that to be reported on in a management review board because are you are you getting the data you need in a quality role or any role to make a decision, right? Yes or no. And if you don't, then you know it's a different thing. But we aren't reporting that metric at all. That's, that's true. And even you know, you you trigger something for me there. Um, we do a lot of this work in the Quality Risk Management Institute, and we're building these types of proactive tools at the moment. But you trigger something for me there. Like, are we able to make a timely decision? Mm -hmm. So is it increasing our, our our decision velocity? Now, I'm not saying let's just take a quick decision, gut instinct. Are we, as a result of being more data based? and more scientific about being knowledge seeking as opposed to asking an expert an sme um you know what's your gut what's your gut feeling go and ask an expert well let's have a look at the data what does the science tell us what does our knowledge of our process and product tell us so and as a result of that is that reducing down the time in which we're able to make sound risk-based decisions um uh, and and you know when you think about risk which you know everything around the quality system is about reducing risk what we're effectively trying to do there is reduce uncertainty and reduce subjectivity because the more subjectivity we have the more risk we have the more uncertainty we have the more risk we have so if we're trying to reduce uncertainty you do that with data you get your science behind it if you're trying to reduce subjectivity you you know you try and remove the the, the requirement for you to have that one sme in the room to give you the answer you you want to have you know a broad base of diverse opinions and and some science and hard fact behind it if you have it or a comparable data set if it's a new product so these are the things that we need to be looking at now that we can slice and dice the data and we can see are we being more predictive on our first round of of, of um, risk um, uh, risk identification how many times have we got to go back and revisit that risk assessment because we're picking stuff up in the field so did we, you know, did we get a mark of 100% because we got all of the risks identified in the first round? Or did we only get 60% of them and we've been uncovering them ever since, you know, uh, through um, uh, by, by accident rather than design? So these are the things that we need to start building in in terms of, of really being enabling our leadership to, to be effective and drive, you know, drive the right business outcomes. Yeah. And not only this, I think leadership is key and essential in order to drive the quality culture. Yeah? So if we are just focused on compliance and, and these kind of things, then we'll probably be more focused on, OK, are we compliant? How many cuppers we close? They were closed on time and so on. And maybe if they do not have access to the data, yeah, they probably will not be asking, OK, how many cuppers? Are repeated cuppers, for instance. Yeah. So how many times do we need to do the same in order to correct? or to prevent actions that already happened in the past. Yeah. So if you are not having the world picture of all the quality issues that you have in your area, yeah, you probably will not be dealing with this. We will just would try to say, okay, we are compliant, so we can pass an inspection. So next step. But I think it's really essential in order to assess the risks that we have, yeah, and compare with all the data that we have available there. Yeah. Great point. And Daniel, I wonder if you might continue and, and kind of elaborate on any predictive analytics initiatives that either you have experience with or kind of your expectations as we move this forward. Yeah, as I mentioned before, so we are really trying to do one step forward, yeah, and, and get access to 
business data that is being available during our clinical studies, yeah, in order to support decisions, in order to support risk that we have, yeah. And we recently ran a successful predictive analytics pilot analyzing data from our clinical studies. We took in consideration um, different parameters like adverse events, notification, protocol deviation, search recruitment, so all these kind of things, yeah. And we analyzed them with the goal to correlate side key risk indicators and features in clinical data with quality metrics. The goal was really try to predict risks of quality issues at sites, yeah? And the results of this model should um, provide us with a recommendation of which sites might be more risky and should be included in our risk-based auditing program, yeah? And then the result of the executed audits uh, based on this prediction should also help us to confirm and adjust this model. Yeah, very powerful. Thank you. So to pivot a little bit away from, you know, the, the data itself, I wonder if we could spend a little time focusing on the system introductions, right? So at least in the theme of launching new systems efficiently, how would you rate the uptake of adoption of automated testing for validation testing of our new quality system software? You know, we think about manufacturing, we've been using automation in, in manufacturing for many, many years now. Um, so interested in your thoughts um, on the differences in adoption rates when we think about um, automation for testing as opposed to automation for production. Yeah, I think this is where we're behind. Right? I think we're, you know, we're we're trying our best. We're we're all in the cloud. We're using SaaS solutions, and we're using an old time way of validating and keeping up with the forced releases. I I'm still looking at how do we do regression testing for high functionality, high risk functionality for SaaS solutions. A lot of the time we're we're going in and we're doing a great job validating, but we're not really saying, okay, here's our functional risk assessment. Here's our 12 functions that during every upgrade or every release, force release, we're just gonna run them through automatic. Just hit the button, have an automated test. That way we don't have to sit and you know worry about did the forced release break anything in our high functionality. It appears that we might be doing a lot of like paperless validation and going online, but we really haven't gotten to that sweet spot of really automating, really automating the things. Some of us are doing it, but I don't see it as part of the kickoff. I don't ever see it built in right away. As part of that project plan, where is the creation of automatic, automated test scripts for regression testing? Just right away, where are they at? Why aren't they being built at the beginning? Because right now our technology and whether we like it or not is going to be updated all the time. It's gonna be real time. We're gonna get SaaS solutions. I mean, if you look at even things I talked about, Snowflake, right? Every 30 days, they're gonna push, right? Some changes. Viva, we've all lived the Viva, right? We've all lived that, the quarterly releases and things like that. And I think sometimes we do our little risk assessment and we say, nope, it's not gonna affect it, but we really don't, have any automated tests just to push and run our workflows through and say, okay, for this fall release, we just automate automatically tested our high functionality, we're done. But um, we're falling behind. And I don't know if it's a trust level, because like I just came off of cell manufacturing, and we had to automate all those processes to enable capacity, right? Because each batch record is a is one person, right for their cells. So I don't know in our industry if we're not trusting the automated tools or it's the skill set uh, that we're learning how to use automated tools for testing. I, I'm just not sure the slow adoption. I'm seeing a lot more people and I'm, I'm hoping we all as a industry push it more and more. And with the new CSA coming out, a lot of informal testing would be a great opportunity for automation. But yeah, we're slow. We're really slow. We're still... We still like our paper. We still like writing as expected. I don't know why we love that, but you know, we still we have all these little behaviors we feel comfortable with. But I I think we won't be able to keep up with all the SaaS solutions until we. And not all systems should have an automated test, but you know, our high risk ones and our our workflows, you know, on our safety systems, things like that. We should be investing in automated testing right at the beginning. 
Yeah, thank you. Any other thoughts from the team on this? So then just from that, you know, perspective there, right, if we could be using automated testing, you know, leveraging a risk-based approach. We, we've talked a lot about that um, so far today and the importance of kind of risk management in the business. Um, and, you know, Nula, wondering if you could kind of continue on a, a thread you were talking about earlier with that opportunity for continuous improvement, OPEX in a regulated business, you know, bringing with it the measurable reduction in risk to the business and the patients, which then kind of allows that faster turn. Um, through our data monitoring and analytics, are we actively measuring, compiling evidence of risk reduction in the business? And what are your thoughts on addressing this? Yeah, uh, you know, I think it's 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 a really hot topic, and I think as ICHQ9 is going through its review, uh, we're going to see um, more expectation. Certainly, the rapporteur for ICHQ9's revision is um, one of our colleagues, uh, an Irish regulator, uh, Dr. Kevin O'Donnell, uh, a good friend of of, of JVT, and. Um, I know that his hot topic is risk reduction. How do we measure this risk reduction? You know, we're saying that we're, we're you know, reducing risk, but we don't have any hard evidence of, of that. And to, you know, to the point that we've just been talking about, these automated tests and things like that, those kind of running automated test scripts um, that does that kind of short verification cycles in the background that indicates that you don't have, you know, a potential business continuity issue coming at you because of a, a patch that's been um, applied to one of your systems um, or an up update. We're, we're really not good. Uh, we, we kind of stake our claim on saying, oh, well, we've done our risk assessment. So th that's that's where our risk reduction is. But we're not good at then, you know, confirming and verifying that to say, yes, that has actually contributed to risk reduction. Now, where we see, you know, um, one side of the industry that has been doing this for years and years and years, and we've been blithely ignoring them, is our, our safety colleagues. Um, and, you know, they've been doing things like near miss investigations and, you know, really looking and, and surfacing near misses. And, you know, sometimes I feel that a near miss in a, in a quality situation is, is like, you know, we've dodged a bullet. Oh, you know, they didn't look at, they didn't ask us for that record, or, you know, during the inspection or during the um, uh, during the customer audit or whatever. You know, wow, good, thank goodness they didn't ask about that skeleton in that cupboard, you know. Um, but instead, you know, we should be looking at every opportunity to surface those near misses. Um, and um, because that's real time live data on something that almost went wrong, on something that we thought we had adequately controlled with by applying a risk control in there. Um, but then, you know, in the field, um, when it's being, you know, run every day, every batch, every day, um, these are the opportunities that we could be capturing those and then building those in as what would we do to, you know, like the other industries have been, you know, car industry, they've been using things like mistake proofing, Pokayoka as another OPEX tool to say, okay, we've surfaced an issue. Um, let's not just do an administrative control, please, you know, blame, shame and retrain and let, add, add three more belts and braces into the SOP. Um, uh, but actually look at, you know, practical strategies of how can we avoid that problem uh, arising, you know, whether it's somebody has inadvertently accessed data that they shouldn't have done, um, but they surface that. Um, or, or, you know, so how did that happen as part of the build out or, you know, maybe people have moved apartments and they've taken their legacy um, system administration rights with them. I mean, that's just talking about access to electronic systems. But, you know, we can go right down to, um, you know, physical systems in the field where we can be mistake proofing by color coding or making sure that there's only one type of snap connection in an area and things like that. So there's no chance that somebody can connect the wrong manifold and you know we end up with the wrong way with the wrong product and um, the other thing then is actually getting those folks on the on the ground actively involved in 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 reporting good catches again this is like these key behavioral indicators that i talked to you about so where they see an opportunity to improve because when we put these systems in place whether they're electronic or business processes with the best of intentions, they're being written in a back office somewhere because the system isn't up on its legs yet. Um, so, you know, very often it's not until it's in the field and we're starting to see kind of field reports coming back 
we should be taking those as good catches and opportunities to improve. Now, we're not going to fix everything, but we certainly can try out and look at where the priorities are. And in all of those cases, that's building in um, uh, you know, risk reduction, but more importantly, continuous improvement in, into our systems. So, you know, I, I think we have to connect the people and the, the data in, in a way that enables us to actually move forward um, and leverage some of, of our colleagues. I, th I think we mentioned earlier on that, you know, we have a, a you know, kind of history of silo mentalities, which is why we end up with these silo data lakes. Um, uh, and, and we still within our organization, because of the way our hierarchies have grown, we still have those silos in place. But I think we, you know, we need to work with our partners in, in who work in the OPEX or the enterprise excellence part of the business and get some of their skills and thinking and mindsets into our quality and CSV and data integrity and, and you know, look at some, or, or our safety colleagues, as I've said, and actually get it kind of a coming together in terms of best practices. Thank you. So in this theme of then monitoring, Daniel, I'd love to get your input on this. So since, you know, now talking about the systems themselves, since it, testing is often a one-time activity, providing a snapshot of the current status of a system at a given point in time, so either through the initial validation or during change implementation, what are your thoughts on leveraging other activities like continuous testing, continuous validation, or data quality analysis in order to evaluate and monitor the validated state of a system? Yeah, well, I think this question is very related to the previous one that we have about automated testing. Yeah, And considering that agile development and shorter release cycles are being implemented across the board and not only for uh, SaaS systems, I think that test automation and continuous validation are approaches that will become a must for all systems in the future. Having a system getting more and more complex with uh, not having the possibility to perform regression testing for all the functions implemented in the system, yeah. Maybe we should think about other type of, of also, I don't know how good you, for instance, are in writing good user requirements or functional requirements, yeah. But at the end of the day, what is important is what you get out of the system so that the system really does what it's meant to do, yeah. And sometimes, we are testing things and we are saying, okay, everything seems to be good, yeah, but should we start applying, I don't know, quality data analysis and issue management monitoring systems in order to see, okay, how is the system then um, working once we move it into production? So how good were we applying user requirements or defining user requirements and functional specifications? Because sometimes I do see that we are not that good in these kind of things, yeah? And at the end of the day, you get something that it's not exactly what you were expecting to do, but testing is over, validation is closed, yeah? And then you need to deal with the system, yeah? Yeah, thank you. So we've had a lot of great discussion from some of the, the questions that, you know, we came up with together, and now it's time for us to see what any participants um, have for us. And so a few questions have come in already. Um, so, you know, a few minutes ago, uh, we were discussing a lot about what to do with data. The question is, any decisions uh, we take are obviously dependent on how we define and who is involved with the collection of those data. So any discussion on who the stakeholders are in collecting and defining? Talked a little bit about that, kind of the role of leadership, but wondering, you know, if one of you could expand on kind of that stakeholder involvement um, with the data piece. Anybody want to take that? I mean, I, I think we're, we're we're not good at defining our stakeholders at the front end, you know, because we take a very functional approach, as as Daniel said, to developing our systems, and and you may have you know a particular process owner or a, you know a functional lead who's the business owner for that, and they have a specific set of you know outcomes that they're looking from the system but they're not really thinking about the use cases um and and very often they're thinking in a very small you know narrow way of who's going to use this as in it's it's them and their team in their function are going to use it and that's part of um of the fact you know we, we we've talked about um communications um uh, a little bit you know if you look at that ichq9 um uh, concept 
um, or indeed within the ICHQ10 pharmaceutical quality system, it, it, we, it's almost like a one-way communication. We don't, we don't have a dialogue. We, you know, the, here's the, here's the review, here's the report, here's the memo. Um, but in fact, what we, you know, what we need to be thinking about is who are the users who may have completely different needs for this information and what are those use cases? So who are those stakeholders and have we involved them in the development of the user requirements or the functional requirements? Um, uh, and, and that often leads us to a situation that we have something that has been validated, has been installed, it's fit for purpose, it's doing its job in production or in the field, um, but in fact, we, we then suffer from locked-in syndrome because nobody else knows we have that data or we, you know, they're not um, invited to that SharePoint folder where some of the reports are held, and we don't even think about how somebody else might be able to use this. And, and, you know, when you think about, you know, some of our CPV or continued process verification data that's coming from our products now, you have a lot of, you know, a product and process stewards or process owners who have access to that data. But then when you look at the other side of the house, you've got folks who are, you know, maybe dealing with a customer complaint, maybe dealing with a, you know, a timely closeout of an investigation. They may, you know, really get a lot of value in having access to that data. But unless they know someone or they bump into someone at the water cooler, when we used to be around a water cooler together, um, they may never know that we have um, a, 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 you know, a, a resource that we can that we can tap into. So I, I think it's a really good point. And, and I think we need to be thinking about what are the use cases and who are those stakeholders and getting them involved beyond just the functional business owner. Uh, it's, it's a really good point. Good question. And I, I think it is. And I'd also add on how do we pull that data? Because I think we've all experienced where maybe the person doesn't know how to write the query. You know, they need some help and they're not really harnessing the data correctly. Because if, especially if you're making GXP decisions, we got to be sure how we're pulling that data to make sure it's, you know, the technology we're using has been tested to pull that whole data, especially for key decisions. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think what we are missing sometimes is really to consider the overall life cycle of data. Yeah. And we need also to put data in the middle of everything. Yeah. So data in the past was something resulting from our, your processes. Yeah. But I think nowadays, at least in the pharmaceutical R&D arena, yeah, data is the new goal. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. with data. Oh, okay. Can you still? Okay. We're still here. Thank you. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, Data is really what we are getting of all our activities, yeah. And I think we sh we we should start thinking about from the very beginning to the end and what to do with this data. Sometimes when we are doing validation for systems, we are just focusing on one specific system, and usually we have the problem in the interfaces. So moving from one system to the next one, moving from one process to the next one, do we have really a complete data life cycle for the overall development phase or something like? That? I think this is what probably we are lacking, and I think a good data governance and, and, and data landscape could help us here. Yes, thank you. A couple questions coming in around mm -hmm. automated testing. So a uh, question, do you think the slow adoption of automated testing is due to some validation groups requesting automated test suites go through burdensome validation? So how is that impacting adoption rates, do you guys think? Yeah, I can take this at the beginning. Yeah, I think it is. I think we're, you know, other industries have used these standard automated testing tools like Tosca, whatever, for years and years for, you know, automated hospital equipment that does surgery. They're using this tool to automate testing. And I think that we have to, again, look at the risk level of the software vendor, how long has it been being used for automated testing? And I, I do agree that we're holding it to too high of a rigor, especially these tools that have been around 20, 30 years. But again, it's also about the skill set of the person writing the automated tests, right? That needs to be looked at too. But if we did that at the beginning of any sort of system implementation, you could almost really qualify this tool as part of that implementation of that other system because you could concurrently do some manual testing right and then run your automated test and show you know they're consistent so yeah i think a lot of um, companies are saying it's too heavy of a lift 
to really qualify this automated testing tool and use it. And we got to get over that, in my opinion, because these tools have been out there for 20 years. <laughs> yeah, and a follow on that someone had is when it comes to automated validation, any thoughts on the vendor selling their own automated validation solution? Is this seen as a benefit as they know their system the best or is this a conflict of interest? Well, I think it's what type of system. I've seen this a lot with ERP systems um, where the vendor will come in and say, we have um, our own automated testing toolkit that we can use to implement the ERP. I think, again, it depends on what is the system you're implementing? How long has the vendor been using this tool? You know, pulling it through. How do they train their you know, developers to write the automated test script? You know, just kind of your general audit. I think it can be a really nice benefit if it's a solid toolkit with a solid team doing it i think you can move much quicker but doing your due diligence just like you would do anything else but you also have to be independent when that vendor goes away how do we do our change control how do we do our releases inside you don't want to build a lot of dependencies i mean you can do that but that's risky right for the vendor but you kind of want to make sure okay what would happen if something happened to this vendor how would we take on this automated toolkit ourselves internally and keep the system validated because it's it's nice to out you know give that all to them to do but always have it in the back of your mind what would happen if we had to take this internally i mean please let's not go back to paper but what would happen we went out to yes thank you yeah and now i think if you have some oh sorry i just wanted to mention that if you have some burden about validating this kind of tools yeah I think at least they could be used um, if we are considering agile development processes, yeah, to really perform a big amount of informal testing, yeah, and then delivering better products that, that at the end of the day it could be formally tested in a different way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can I just, you know, again, uh, here I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm connecting the human all the time. But, you know, again, we're, we're not we're not mobilizing all of the latent energy in our organizations because we're assuming, oh, well, if we validated it and then if we, you know, we only automate the um, the ongoing continuous verification of that system, um, uh, you know, something dreadful could be happening down in the field and we wouldn't know about that. But, you know, and it comes back to this communication piece again of plugging in the users. So if there was a situation, I mean, heaven forbid we're having updates, you know, every week, but let, let's say we're having them once a quarter or something like that. As you log into that system as a system user, if there has been a, uh, you know, an updated event, if you were notified and if you were trained as part of the of the of the process of saying, if you notice anything unusual when you're using the system uh, in the coming days, uh, please alert. Here's how you do your alerts. So now you're actually capturing, you know, the eyes and ears and using the people on the ground to verify that your automated testing is 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 fit for intended use um but we we don't we don't connect the dots you know and we don't mobilize that that latent energy we have of of all of those eyes and ears that we have and we assume it has to happen somehow in the background and like it's all verified um but if we asked you know it's it's a, 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 when we when we see the next question on the apqrs i think you know sometimes we have to ask the folks have you seen anything unusual i mean i talk about doing data gimbas like get out from behind your computer and go and talk to the users and ask them, you know, have they had any unusual experiences with their systems? And, um, you know, have they, you know, uh, uh, found themselves with access to something that they shouldn't have or something like that? Um, uh, so, so connect the dots on that and, and get the communications um, good. So if there is an update on a significant system, the, the, the main folk who use that system, they should be notified. And, and ask to, to to share their observations if there is any. Yeah, and when we expand that thought to cloud-based solutions, right? If we look at the broader community and forums yeah. and things like that, you know, we could even increase the, the power of more eyes and ears in, in yeah. that direction. Really great point. Absolutely. So we only have three minutes left. We have two questions. So we'll maybe do a speed round on these last two questions. Um, are APQRs relevant in the context of CPVs and continuous data monitoring? Uh, uh, speed round, yes. You have to keep the people in there. Um, uh, so again, um, really good uh, to have the data. And for sure, you can automate a huge amount of the heavy lifting 
of your APQRs and give yourself the best opportunity of succeeding to get them done on time, which is something the regulators like to see. Um, uh, so you can have an awful lot of the heavy lifting, but you can't completely divorce the human decision at the end of the day. Somebody has to make a call, look at that and make sure that that makes sense and that there's consistency across all of your external, you know, customer complaints and everything else. It's not just about the CPV data. And so a one minute answer on a question that we could probably write a book on is what's the best effective approach of validating a data lake that will house GXP and non-GXP data? Okay. At least I would, first talking. of all, not validate. I would qualify the platform, mm -hmm. um, whether you're using Snowflake or not. And then I would, um, the lake is going to be, I would look more at a data mart. Um, and qualifying that data mark, you know, GXP data mark. But if you're going to mix GXP and non-GXP data in a lake, I would say, okay, then have a data mark to pull it out or something like that. That would be your qualified data mark that you could continuously use over and over for GXP data. But I'm not sure what, you know, the problem, you know, because you would not validate any of the platform. You would qualify it. Sorry, that was longer than 30 seconds. <laughs> no, that was perfect. And we're wrapping it now. Apologies to the attendee who sent in one last question. I actually don't have visibility to what the question is. I just saw one came in. Um, but really want to thank the panelists uh, for this lively, dynamic discussion. Such um, a fun dialogue and, and so many great topics covered. Um, and thank you to all the attendees who uh, logged in to watch this. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again to our moderator, Michelle Miller, and the esteemed panelists, Elise Deegan, Nula Kalnan, and Daniel Caparos for sharing their expertise. Also, a big shout out to our producer, Ben Kitchen, for all his time in editing these sessions. And lastly, thank you to you, our valued listeners. We want to hear your thoughts and questions on this topic. Also, please remember to subscribe in your podcast player of choice. See you number